सो अ वेरी गुड मॉर्निंग टू एवरी वन यर थैंक यू एट दी आउट साइड थैंक यू डॉक्टर बंसी फॉर हैविंग मी फॉर टूडेज डिस्कशन ऑन डायबिटिक न्यूरोपैथी अ बर्निंग इश्यू एंड वी ऑल वुड अग्री दैट इट इज डेफिनेटली अ बर्निंग इश्यू विच वी ऑल सी इन अ रूटीन डे टू डे क्लिनिकल प्रैक्टिस so um diabetic neuropathy it's like you know our patients telling us don't get on my nerves they have enough problems diabetic neuropathy is one of the most common complication which we encounter in our patients with diabetes affecting around 50% of our patients and you know this painful neuropathy is associated with increased distress a poor quality of life leading to a reduce in reduction in productivity and employment and which indirectly or directly impacts the economic burden on the patient and the healthcare system so around the, uh, uh, currently the patients which we have diabetes 16 to 20% of our patients are suffering from chronic painful diabetic neuropathy and what we need to understand here is 39% have not even received any treatment for their pain while 12.5% have never even reported to their doctor sometimes they do not even find that it's related to diabetes they do not even understand that they need to report to their doctors and get cured for it our own data epidemiological data from dr mohan center in the cure studies uh, has said that the prevalence of diabetic neuropathy is around 26.1% in our population which is significantly associated with age hba1c and the duration of diabetes so how do you define the, uh, the diabetic neuropathy the ada says that is diabetic neuropathy is a descriptive term meaning a demonstrable disorder either clinically evident or subclinical that occurs in the setting of diabetes without the other causes of peripheral neuropathy the neuropathic disorders includes manifestation in the somatic or the autonomic parts of the peripheral nervous system now what what is the pathology or what are the pathogenesis factors which would cause this neuropathy so there are many factors most common ones are metabolic factors like dysglycemia dyslipidemia long duration of diabetes advanced glycation end products sorbitol autoimmune factors that cause inflammation in the nerves ischemia of the nerves mechanical injury to the nerves abnormalities of the schwann cells or impaired neurotropic support and defective de regeneration here i would like to add that there can be you know in sudden decrease in a1c say if you bring down the a1c by 2% in 3 months there can be acute painful neuropathy in a patient or there is a term called as insulin neuritis which is also a small fiber neuropathy which can be seen in a patients who are on insulin so when we discuss about the risk factors which cause diabetic neuropathy there are either modifiable risk factors or non modifiable so modifiable can definitely be a good glycemic control hypertension correction stop cigarette smoking alcohol hypertriglyceridemia and reduced weight non modifiable can be older age male sex height family history of neuropathy apoa genotype and various others now when we try to cl classify the diabetic neuropathies though it's a very elaborate classification it is in general that there can be generalized symmetrical polyneuropathies focal and asymmetrical neuropathies and combinations so in generalized symmetrical polyneuropathies the most common one is the distal sensory or the sensory motor polyneuropathy small fiber or large fiber sensory neuropathy or autonomic neuropathies and then followed by cranial neuropathy truncal neuropathy limbal neuropathy or a combination of these the neuropathic pain which the patient describes to us is very typical if you try to evaluate understand the history of the patient the most common way is talking and glove painful sensations which are very common now while both small and large fibers can be affected the symptoms which the patient complains of can define which is affected first so if it is a small fiber maybe there is more of pain amplification and hyperalgesia with loss of sensitivity can be autonomic symptoms can be present which would predispose to diabetic foot and electrophysiology may not detect the nerve damage of the small fibers while it is large fibers sensory and motor neuro nerves are affected generally the of the feet are affected first there is loss of vibration perception and proprioception there is deep seated gnawing and aching pain muscle wasting can be seen and these abnormalities can be detected by electromyography 
now the the symptoms the pains with the patient describes can be you know positive symptoms due to the excessive activity like spontaneous pain allodynia hyperalgesia dysesthesia or paresthesia or it can be negative symptoms due to deficit of function like hypoesthesia hypoalgesia and analgesia now what is the, uh, the beauty of this is that sensory abnormalities and the pain can paradoxically also coexist and the patient may have a combination of systems uh, symptoms that may change over a period of time so is pain a god's great greatest gift to mankind yes because neuropathy affects most of our, many of our patients and if the patient is not feeling the pain the chances of foot ulcerations can be high so pain is in a way a gift to us that we uh, the patient can report to us if he is having any complaints and these neurotropic symptoms can affect the quality of life no so they can have a positive impact or a negative impact now positive and negative symptoms definitely have a negative impact the quality of life is reduced by how you know everyone has a different pain threshold how the pain is perceived by any individual the painful symptoms can generate anxiety the negative symptoms are associated with depression and this may all lead to sleep disorders which may have a negative impact on the quality of life of our patients so we are here we are trying to help them and when we are, when a patient comes to you with a neuro a pain you know a, a slide about discussing whether it can be a neuropathic pain or a vascular pain so depending on various features like where the pain is situated if it's in the feet more than the calves it can be more of a neuropathic pain the quality of pain which the patient complains of whether it's a sharp superficial burning or a tingling sensation it is more in favor of neuropathy and if it is a deep ache it may favor vascular disease if the pain is present at rest or uh, worsens at night time it is more of neuropathic and the patient uh, has more pain while walking it can be a vascular disease and the glycemic control will definitely bring down the neuropathic pain but not the vascular pain they say that not all, all neuropathic pains in our patients with diabetes are due to diabetic neuropathy there can be other causes 10% of the causes can be different you know it can be different etiologies which may be correctable so differential diagnosis is definitely important so there can be other causes like thyroid or renal disease or there can be infections like hiv hepatitis cidp b12 deficiency in our patients who are vegetarians or on high doses of metformin alcohol so these can be modifiable risk factors and uh, 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 and they can you can if you give the correct treatment the patient's pain may go down now when we talk about the diagnosis of diabetic neuropathy one is the symptoms where you understand the symptoms of the patient whether there is numbness tingling painful sensations look at the signs like lost reflexes decreased sensation joint deformity skin changes then the quantitative sensory uh, testing like with a biothermometer or a tuning fork um, or uh, with a 10 gram monofilament or there it can be objective measures with electrophysiology uh, electromyography x-ray and ultrasound diabetic pain or diabetic neuropathy pain can progress over a period of time there can it can occur intermittently at any time or it can be continuous and what happens is as i discussed earlier also the patients may not discuss this pain with you and sometimes you have to be proactively asking whether he has any complaints of any tingling numbness to figure out the patient is having any diabetic neuropathy along with the testings now coming to the management part which is the most important part so according to the ada definitely a strict glycemic control in both type 1 and type 2 diabetic patients with lifestyle modification is one of the mainstay in the treatment of diabetic neuropathy there are other factors also which we can help our patients like neurostimulatory psychological complementary alternatives uh, lifestyle changes interventional anesthetics physical rehabilitation along with the pharmacotherapy of treating the neurological pain now talking about what drugs are available for treating uh, this pain they are divided into various classes so we have the gabapentinoids we have the pregabalin and the gabapentin and that where which all these medications come with some amount of side effects we all know that then we have the snris which are the serotonin norepinephrine reuptake inhibitors where we have duloxetine venlafaxine tricyclic antidepressants like amitriptyline uh, nortriptyline or imipramine and the opioids like tramadol then we have local applications like capsaicin ointment and then uh, you know tens which is uh, transcutaneous electrical nerve stimulation so every all these molecules are prescribed over a period of time 
uh, there are not many studies on these molecules, but if these molecules, they say that start effect by one week shows the maximum effect by 12 weeks. If the patient does not have any benefit, maybe you can go to an another class after 12 weeks. Not many studies have been done on these. The maximum they have data is up to five months of usage. So maybe we'll, have, we'll need to have more studies on these molecules. But when I looked up the literature, so we you use these molecules a bit more in our clinical practice. So I tried to find out whether these molecules are safe in our patients who have other comorbidities. So when we talk about pregabalin and gabapentin, which we very regularly use, we have to be using it with caution in patients with CV disease because it may cause edema, heart failure, and you know its cardiac safety in clinical practice is yet not known. In renal disease also, the doses is need to be titrated. So we need to bring down the dose if the EGFR is falling below 30. And in hepatic diseases, these molecules can be safely used. When we talk about TCAs, again in CV diseases, use it with caution. Renal disease, it can be used. Hepatic diseases, around 0.5 to 5% patient may develop asymptomatic mild elevation of the serum transaminase levels. But TCAs are contraindicated in prostatic hypertrophy and narrow angle glaucoma. SNRIs, no CV risk, they can be used in patients with cardiovascular comorbidities, renal disease it can be used, but these molecules are contraindicated in hepatic disease because they can cause liver injury. So if the patient is on a duloxetine, then maybe you have to monitor the liver functions on a regular basis. Something like a benfothiamine has shown protective effect in every in all these comorbidities, say CV disease, renal disease, or hepatic disease, and it can be prescribed in patients with all these comorbidities. So this is just an uh, algorithm where you know where, what treatment you need to start. So once the patient comes with a neuropathic pain, you try to find out which type of neuropathy it is, try to rule out. And now if you come down to if it is a distal symmetric polyneuropathy. If the patient has uh, either the patient on gabantinoids or on TCA, uh, uh, um, at, uh, tricyclic antidepressants, if the patient has contraindication to TCA, then gabapentinoids, and then add on molecules if the patient is not relieved over a period of time. The latest guidelines, which was just released in 2022, what it was an add-on to the statement released by the American uh, Association of Neurology in 2011, that there are four classes of medicines which you can prescribe, the SNRIs, the gabapentinoids, the sodium channel blockers, and the, uh, uh, the ATCAs. But sodium channel blockers, though they have advice, you have to use it with a lot of caution because of his, uh, teratogenic effects and causing dysglycemia and weight gain. So these should be the last alternatives if the patient is not relieved with any other medications prescribed to them. These different treatment patterns are not backed with much evidence. There is very moderate or weak evidence uh, with all of them. But uh, something like a clonidine pentoxifilin should preferably not used in patients who are having neuropathic pain. There is insufficient evidence with use of vitamins, benfothiamine, alpha lipoic acid, or vitamin D. But for whatever little effect it has, we can prescribe to our patients. Capsaicin can be used, but some patients do find it intolerant, like they have burning pain on contact with a warm or hot water or in hot environment. Foot care is the key. We had a campaign which was running two months back with RSSDI, Save the Feet and Keep Walking campaign, which re-emphasized the fact that foot checkup, foot care should be done from both the physician side and the patient side on a routine basis. Lifestyle modification has no direct effect on the uh, diabetic neuropathy, but bringing down the blood sugars, the weight, and exercises like Tai Chi, yoga, and Pilates have shown benefits. Also, cognitive behavior therapy and mindfulness have also been recommended to show positive benefits in our patients with neuropathy. Non-pharmacological treatment, patient education is one of the most important one. Electrical stimulation, acupuncture, and surgical decompression, if required, can be offered to the patient. Lot of emerging technologies coming up or not treatments coming up for the patients with neuropathy. Though we do not have much now, we had the aldo reductase inhibitors, but they did not take off well. Maybe something new coming up. Uh, other uh, pro, uh, other molecules have shown effects, but still to uh, get uh, for the use of our patients, something like C peptide, immune therapy, PL37, nerve growth factors have shown uh, some benefits, but still trials and studies are required. So a lot of future research is required in our patients, you know, especially uh, clinical trials which would focus on the effect of quality of life and the physical function when evaluating the efficacy of the new interventions. 
physical trials with head on comparisons of the different medications and most important thing is since it's a chronic problem we need more trials of longer duration so that we can offer these molecules for a longer period of time to our patients so every type of neuropathy has its own uh, you know uh, in a way of treatment so pharmacotherapy is one large fiber neuropathy may require some additional like orthotics or surgical intervention and small fiber foot protection regular foot inspection and supportive soles so it's a team effect it's not only the diabetologist or the physician but we need to take maybe a neurologist on board or a foot care team who you know collectively can help the patients to do better and prevent complications later so concluding keep calm we can burn it down not all cases of diabetic neuropathy are state forward can can be easily managed but most patients can achieve lower levels of pain and better enjoyment of life with fewer adverse effects through the methods used use of more than one medication rational polypharmacy is common in the management and ongoing monitoring of therapy and a close working between the physician and the patient is what is most important so i end my talk by what jk rolling has said that anything anything is possible if you have got enough nerve thank you all for your patient hearing